Christ. How did that happen? How did God get a hold of your heart and draw you into the kingdom? Well, yes, I am a part of that big uh, tribe called Fulani, spread out in 28 countries in Africa. And I'm born and grew up as a Muslim. My father, he's a Quran teacher. He had been teaching Quran his whole life. And my mom, great-grandfather, was a, a king who was doing holy war. So your dad is a Quran scholar, mm -hmm. and your mom's dad is a holy warrior, a jihadist. Yeah. And you that's the family you grew up in. Yes, correct. So now you're a follower of Christ. Yes. When I grow up, I never met a Christian in my life until I was 17. And to meet a Christian, I have to go to a bigger city because where I grew up, there was no one. And uh, when I finished my elementary school, we didn't have a middle school. So I had to go to uh, like a bigger city to continue my study over there. When I was there, I had to stay in somebody's house. So we didn't have any relative over there. So And I keep moving every year. In the third year when I was playing soccer, and I become a friend with one guy, and I told him, you know, my friend, I may not see you again because I don't have a place to stay next year. So, and he talked to his dad, and his dad allowed me to come to stay at his house, and his dad was working for, for some missionaries. So, so that was the first Christian that you had ever met. Did you notice anything in that household that was different from the house you grew up in be, because of their faith? Was it... Did you see differences in their family? Well, it was so different because first time that I, I met this this missionary and first thing that he told me it is he, to ask me if I want to do Bible study. Well, I said, yeah, okay, I want to do it because I wanted to gain some knowledge because my dad was teaching me that, you know, the Prophet Islam was saying, go and find knowledge even in China. For me, learning about the Bible was just finding knowledge. And truly, I was finding a lot of knowledge in the Bible <laughs> uh, because that was the first time that when I started reading, you know, from Genesis, you know, I just first time that I know that God created the world in six days. And this is what he did the first day. This is what he did the second day and the third day. Because in what I learned before, you, they will tell you that he created the world, but it was not like lined it up that way. So I was so excited for knowing all the details for the first time and uh, also knowing about the lineage, about, you know, all the big prophets that I already know before, who is a father of who and who and who, and all the details was fascinated in me, you know, to read more about the Bible. I was so excited about it. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Malik. He is a leader in the spirit of martyrdom in Northwest Africa. So in your mind, you were still a good Muslim, but you're reading the Bible to kind of expand your knowledge. And, and really, did you see that as, as ultimately that would make you a better Muslim? Well, no, I wasn't trying to be a better Muslim, but because remember I was a student, I would get all this biblical knowledge, you know, and when I speak with my friends and things like that, I will use some of this, you know, phrases and I will say it, you know, and they will say, man, he's so wise. But they didn't know where I get it from <laughs> because I was getting it from the Bible. <laughs> so that was just to make me look good. So at what point did you just start to feel like, wait a minute, this might be more important than the Quran. This might be true, more true than the Quran. Well, this journey took me five years, honestly. And I was reading the Bible twice a year. I read the Bible ten times even before I became a Christian. And during this five years journey, I was watching the life of the missionaries. You know, there was loving and caring. And I was saying, oh, you know what? I'm going to go and try to make them Muslim. Because when they die, they will go to heaven. Because they are such nice people. I didn't want, go, want them to go to hell. And I went over there and I talked to the missionary. And he told me, no, I cannot believe on that because this is so mixed up. That, and I said, oh, wow, okay. You know, and I was so mad that day, you know. And I said, well, I'm going to go back home. You know, and I decided that I will take a like highlighter. I will take the Bible and I will underline all the mistakes in the Bible and take it back to the missionary and show him that the Bible is wrong. But this time, you know, I have to have something, you know, best knowledge that I will evaluate, you know, the Bible with the Quran that I know in my head. And this is when I discover, you know, there was no mistake in the Bible, but there was mistake in the Quran. That was a bad news for me. <laughs> 
What what were some of those mistakes that, that you came across that you're like, wait a minute, the Bible says this, but the Quran says this? Well, if I have to say all oh, the mistakes, we're going to spend the rest of the day <laughs> here. But, you know, I will just uh, pull out one or two. One of them was like they was taking about Lucifer, like Satan. You know, that was a very close angel and doing all the best thing and praying and worshiping, you know, the God everywhere. And now he did one mistake only which is not sum- to be submit to like the creator, which the creation, which is Adam, you know, and he's been kicked out of the garden. So, and that was just one single sin. And uh, Adam and Eve being like in the garden for so many years, <laughs> you know, living fearfully and, you know, great. And now they did one single sin, so God have to kick them out of the garden. So, and I know that I had more than one sin <laughs> personally. <laughs> so I said, like, wow, this is, this is a problem here. I have a problem. You have a sin problem. Yeah, a sin problem, yeah. How did you come to understand that, that Christ was the answer to your sin well, problem? Well, after that, when I have a bad news about, you know, I will not be able to make it even if I continue to be Muslim, so I start crying out to God, you know, and I told him, God, you know, there are so many ways, you know, and each way he's saying this is the right way going to you. So I want to know the true way going to you. This was happening in, the, in my dad's native village. Because the missionary was in furlough, and I never been in a church. I never been, you know, I never made a pass in my life. So I was there, and I was crying out to God. And one night, you know, I see, I see Jesus standing in front of me, you know, and I ask him this question: Are you the one that I need to follow, or did I need to follow somebody else? He quoted the verses John fourteen verse six: "I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one is not going to the Father without passing through." Man, I get up and I freak out because I was thinking that Satan it was just trying to pull up my leg to make me Christian. And I didn't want to be a Christian, you know, because I was, that was very scary for me. Right. You know, after that, and I had been really thinking about it, processing it, you know, because having a dream is not something easy to forget like that, you know. And something was whispering in me saying, if, in case, <laughs> just in case, if this is the truth. I said, wow, okay. And I wanted a confirmation, and I start crying out again to God, you know, for him to help me, if it is a truth, to show me a confirmation. Two weeks later, you know, I get a confirmation from the same dream. And I get up, and I, and I come out of the, of the bed, I kneel down, and I accept Jesus Christ as my personal server. I was sold out to Jesus. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Malik. He is from Northwest Africa. He is a part of the Fulani tribe. Malik, your father is a Quranic instructor. Your grandfather on your mother's side is a jihadist. I can't imagine that your family was very excited about your decision to follow Jesus. What happened? <laughs> and my dad's native village is a very interesting village because it's, its house old is a Quranic school. And people will send, like, uh, the kids from different villages and different parts of the country to come to study over there. And my dad was, like, uh, traveling in a lot of parts of the country studying new schools. And uh, when, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a village where I, I give my life to Jesus also. That was very interesting because when I give my life to Jesus, I stop praying as a Muslim prayer. Believe me, that will not take them long to find out that you are not praying. Because they pray f- five times a day. And easily they cut that I stop praying. And they start persecuting me. And one of them, one of my uh, relatives over there was telling me, you know, Islam allowed us to kill you if you don't pray in three days. How did God help you through that? Because like you said, you'd never been to church. Yeah. Y- you, you hadn't been to Bible school. You had yeah. read the Bible yeah. a number of times. Mm-hmm. How did God help you even in, in the the first days of your faith to withstand that pressure? Well, uh, when I was in the village, my older brother, one of my older brothers, which is the lineage in my father's older brother, uh, son, we we had to go to help him to harvest millet. And millet is very itchy. It's, uh, it's like corn. And we harvest it with our hands. And uh, that previous night when this guy was saying this, was, you know, threatening my life, there w- it was a presence of many villages who come from different parts who come to help. Because this guy, he's a coronary teacher also, and uh, a lot of people come to help him because he's a spiritual leader. Right. You know, and that was, 
the moment that was he was telling me if you don't pray for three days is that allowed us to kill you and uh it's uh well i was i was ready to die you know and i and i have the conviction even if they kill me i will go to heaven and uh, uh the next morning 7 a.m we we took off we went to the field and we start working and from 7 a.m to 2 p.m this guy who was saying this, that they're going to kill me if i don't pray he was preaching to me in a mazan way from uh from 7 a.m to 2 p.m but i was listening everything that he was saying but more i was listening more i was rooted in the word of god and knowing what i choose is the right path you know until like 2 p.m when it was so itchy and believe me uh north africa is very hot and it was so hot and uh, uh this thing will cut you and uh when you sweat and it's it's very painful and everybody was just like down and i never been in a church and at that very moment it looked like i have a run um, god renew my strength i feel like you know i just start working and i never i never heard anybody singing i'm not, still today i'm not a singer so those who know me know that i don't sing you know i sing from my heart but i start like putting some words since i read the bible so many times i would pick up a word here and over there and put it together and i start singing and working i work so hard until like almost like 7 p.m. and this guy had been watching me you know how lovely and joyful i was in the way that i was helping you know he said truly this guy he have a good heart and since then he never say a word about me wow so yeah. god used that just to give you favor yeah with with the people did when you went out to the field that day did you think there was a chance they were going to kill you that day well i was ready i was ready truly wow yeah So I'm curious to know did you ever go back to that missionary and say you were right I was wrong now now I'm following yes, Jesus too Yes yes well uh, one year later you know this missionary come back from Fulo and I was be able to go and to talk to them they were so excited and uh, they woke me through training me and mm-hmm. teaching discipleship. me discipleship yeah. uh, so I will know better more and then I've been uh, baptized after I get baptized the man who was hosting me he's the one who told my younger brother about me giving my life to Jesus and the word out go to my father and to my parents and all of that man i was not there but somebody told me when my mom heard that i was a christian she felt on the ground and she took her to the hospital wow because there's a biggest shame that somebody can do in my in my culture So and because I'm the first Christian in my community. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Malik. He is a Fulani from Northwest Africa, a follower of Jesus Christ. What is it like now with your family? Your obviously your father was not happy at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Are you in good relationship with them now? Yeah, when I when I when I become Christian, you know, all my all my parents and my family rejected me and they didn't want to talk to me for two years nobody even <laughs> didn't want to shake my hand and uh i uh, remember one of my younger brothers who's science teacher today he told me this he said to me malik you brought shame to our community you brought shame to our family not only you are a christian but you are trying to make others christian but today we praise god after watching mm, uh, my work with jesus and all the thing that is happening and the lord is using us and uh, today they are very proud of me clearly they have seen that that god has made a difference in your life yes. they they have seen that difference one of the things that we and i mentioned this in the open we often hear about fulani in the con, in the context of fulani are persecuting christians fulani are attacking christian villages mm-hmm. in northern nigeria in other places What is it like for Christian Fulani like you in that in that sort of wider context of this is a very strongly Islamic tribe like they have a very strong Islamic identity what is it like for Christians in that situation Well we we say that the Fulani they are the one who brought Islam in uh, in Africa uh, or most of the part of the Africa 
and they took ownership of Islam. They do that because uh, they persecuted people because they think what they are doing is right. And we talk about this as brothers and sisters, you know, Fulani, a Christian, we say, okay, our ancestors brought Islam in our countries. We have to take out Islam out of our country. We have to bring Christ to our people. I remember when I was uh, in, uh, after I was trained in a Bible school and I started doing a practical ministry, how to share the gospel, my dad came to visit me one day because he heard that I start a work. And he was so excited because he was thinking that I started work that I would be able like to make money and to support the family. And he came visit me three days later. He had been watching. He said, Mali, what kind of work are you doing? <laughs> That was a question that I was expecting <laughs> from my father, but he, after you know, I, I look at him. I look down. I was trying to think what I gonna say to him, but I didn't want to lie to him. And I look at him and I look down. And the third time, I said that I'm doing the same work that you have been doing, except that I'm preaching about Christ. That was wow. That was like putting a knife in his heart. It was, it was very painful. I can feel that even he get up and he left. And so we, as a Fulani Christian, we want to take the gospel to our people to show them, you know, this is the truth. This is the reality. And I always remind people, even in our own Bible, in John 16, verses 1 to 4, the, Jesus was saying that they will be, you will be kicked out of synagogue. And some of them... It's, they will even kill you thinking that they are saving God that way. I think it's what is happening to the fallen tribe. They are thinking that they are saving God in mm-hmm. that way because of ignorance of knowing, you know, the only Savior is Jesus Christ. So how do you help new believers prepare themselves for the prospect that your father could turn against you, your mother could turn against you, you could get kicked out of the village, they might threaten to kill you, how do you help someone who's come to faith in Christ, maybe even in the first few days, get ready to stand strong in the midst of that? Well, usually I said uh, being persecuted is part of the package for being a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the package. <laughs> yeah, you cannot have the package of Christ without having persecution. That's a no-no thing, you know, because when you become a Christian, you will feel that you betray them and you become an enemy. And like your own family said, yeah. you, you've brought shame on yeah. us. You have yeah. shamed us yeah. by following Christ. Yeah, I remember one time one of uh, the son of the imam in one of the countries that I'm overseeing, he became a Christian. And this is the biggest imam, like spiritual leader in the whole country. And when journalists went over there and asked him, uh, we hear that your son became a Christian. What do you think about it? He said, he's not my son. Because as soon as you become a Christian, you are not part of the yeah, family you're anymore. You're dead to me. Yeah. So how do you get Christians like that imam son? How do you prepare them for that? Well, uh, most of the time they already know the Quran, and uh, we use in many time we it's it's a, I believe me it's a lot easier to to share with somebody if he's willing to listen, and he knows the Quran. It's very easy to share with him with somebody who just believe him, don't know the corner. Why? Because he will be able like to follow you through, mm-hmm. you know, and to understand what you are talking about. But somebody who just believe, if it's a blind b- belief, he will not listen to you. He, so if you start to point out mistakes in the Quran, yes. if they know the Quran, obviously they understand what you're talking about. If they just have heard that they're supposed to know the Quran, but they don't, They'll just get angry. Yeah, they get angry. And that's when it can be brutal and violence against uh, Christianity. You are training church planters and young pastors and sending them out. What What is the key thing for them to be successful in their work? Like, like what's the, the one skill or the one thing that you want to make sure they have when you send them out into ministry? Well, it is love. For being Muslim— and being a Christian, I know what truly lack in what I believed before. And uh, one of the things that uh, we always prepare to people when, uh, like, what we call like the four double way, 
which is like welcome and uh, worship, worship the one creator, which yes. is God, you know, and the word of God, you know, share the word of God. And then the fourth one is witness, witness to the people. So we, we want to make sure that every church planters have to know at least how to do this four things. Uh-huh. That's a great, I like that system a lot. That's yeah. great. Brother Malik, we always want to equip 